Every country has their own perspective of the Second World War. And it's not surprising when experiences and memories are so different. For Americans, the war started in December 1941. Russians think it began in June 1941. Most Europeans, on the other hand, believe it began in Poland in September 1939. But for the Chinese, it started in 1937 with the Sino-Japanese War. And the left in Spain is still convinced it began in 1936 with General Franco's nationalist rising to overthrow the Spanish Republic. Some historians extend the conflict even further, arguing over the long war of the 20th century. Did it last from 1914 to 1945, or from the Russian Revolution in 1917 until the collapse of the Soviet Empire in 1989? I don't start the story with the Nazi invasion of Poland, as you might have expected. I begin a month earlier, in August 1939, when the Japanese army in, Mong in Manchuria clashed with the Red Army on the Mongolian border at the river of Kalkin Gol. In comparison to the vast engagement, which came later, this battle was comparatively small, but it influenced the whole course of the war. General Zhukov, in his first combat command, inflicted such a defeat on the Japanese that it decided not to attack north against Siberia, as many army officers had wanted, who were obsessed in their anti-Bolshevik uh, obsessions. Um, instead, the Imperial um, Japanese Navy would later prevail with its plans to attack south against British and Dutch possessions and American Pacific bases. It also meant that in the winter of 1941, the Japanese refused to help the Germans when they asked them to attack the Soviet Far East to tie down Stalin's Siberian armies as the Wehrmacht advanced on Moscow. Most people see the Second World War as a monstrous state-on-state -state clash between the major powers. Yet it was also an international civil war, especially affecting those countries which had been occupied by an enemy. The fact is that the Second World War was a conglomeration of many different conflicts. And yet, although a truly global war, the Germans and the Japanese did not coordinate their strategies. The conflict stretched from the North Atlantic to the South Pacific, from the snow fields of Norway and Finland to the Libyan desert from jungle fighting in Burma and on the islands and atolls of the Pacific Rim, to SS Einsatzgruppen in the borderlands and Gulag prisoners forced drafted into punishment battalions. For those involved in the fighting in one place, the battles on the other side of the world could have been taking place on another planet. And when it came to the unspeakable cruelties of the Sino-Japanese War, they could have been taking place in the Dark Ages. Today, it's very hard to appreciate the huge historical forces which killed some 60 to 70 million people, perhaps even more. When we dwell on the enormity of the Second World War and its victims, we try to absorb all those statistics of national and ethnic tragedy. But this also makes us overlook the way that the Second World War changed even the lives of survivors in ways impossible to predict. In June 1944, a soldier of Far Eastern appearance surrendered to American paratroopers in the Allied invasion of Normandy. And at first, his captors thought that he was Japanese, but he was in fact Korean, and his name was Yang Chong Jong. In 1938, at the age of 18, Yang had been forcibly conscripted by the Japanese into their Kwantung army in Manchuria. A year later, he was captured by the Red Army at that Battle of Kalkin Gol and sent to a labour camp. The Soviet military authorities, from end of crisis in 1942, drafted him, along with thousands of other prisoners, into their own forces. Then, early in 1943, he was taken prisoner at the Battle of Kharkov in Ukraine by the German army. So, in 1944, now in German uniform, he was sent to France to serve with an Ostbataillon at the base of the Cottontown Peninsula, just inland from Utah Beach. After a time in a prison camp in Britain, he was transferred to another one in the United States. And when released at the end of the war, he settled there. Yang finally died in Illinois in 1992. In a war which killed so many millions of people and has stretched around the globe, this reluctant veteran of 
of the Japanese, Soviet and German armies had been comparatively fortunate. Yet Yang remains perhaps the most striking illustration of the helplessness of most ordinary mortals in the face of what appeared to be overwhelming historical forces. Other stories are striking in different ways and for different reasons. One of the best lessons I ever learned happened to be in the Archive Nationale in Paris. A short paragraph in a report of uh, June 1945 by the French security police, the DSK, recorded that a German farmer's wife had been found in Paris among French deportees returned from camps in Germany. It transpired that she had an illicit affair with a French prisoner of war assigned to their farm in Germany while her husband was on the Eastern Front. She'd fallen so much in love with the of the country of her country that she followed him to Paris by smuggling herself aboard this train of the deportees being returned, and she then she was picked up in Paris by the police. And that was all the detail provided. But these few lines raised so many questions. Would her difficult journey have been in vain even if she'd not been picked up by the police? Had her lover given her the wrong address because he'd already been married? And had he returned home, as quite a few did, to find that his wife had had a baby in his absence by a German soldier? Apparently there were 20,000 who were born in that way. And in any case, the bare bones of the story could almost have been a novel by Marguerite Duras. It is, of course, a tiny tragedy in comparison to the horrors of the Eastern Front. But it remains a poignant reminder that the consequences of decisions by leaders such as Stalin and Hitler ripped apart any certainty in the traditional fabric of existence. Many aspects are also are not as they appear on the surface, as I've learned over the years. I remember as a young officer in Germany, based next door to Belsen concentration camp, being horrified by a memorial to the French Jews who died there. It stated, Aux Juifs Français qui sont morts pour la gloire et la patrie. I found the idea of French Jews dying for glory and the fatherland quite grotesque in such circumstances. Many years later, I mentioned this to the French historian Henri Rousseau. He replied, I entirely understand your reaction, but you're completely wrong. It was the French Jews themselves who insisted after the war that memorials to their dead should have exactly the same wording as those of all the other French. And this was because they would never forgive Vichy for having tried to take away their French citizenship. The conditions under which men fought were so desperate that today we can hardly imagine how they survived. Even many who were there looked back in amazement. One Red Army officer, Vladimir Ivanovich Tulinev, said recently, Nowadays I can't believe that we were able to live in the trenches, in the open field, on the snow, in the cold, never taking off our shoes or clothes, with no water to wash in or source of heat. How on earth did we survive all that? Between 1941 and 1945, some Red Army soldiers, those who survived the battles along the way, fought and marched for more than 12,000 kilometres. Soldiers, afraid both of their enemy and of execution by their own side, were put under terrible psychological pressure. They and Soviet civilians were crushed pitilessly between the two totalitarian regimes. Red Army snipers at Stalingrad, for example, were ordered to shoot starving Russian orphans who'd been tempted with crusts of bread by a German infantrymen to fill their water bottles in the Volga. The proud brutality of Soviet commanders is simply unimaginable in Western democratic societies. When it came to ruthlessness, General Zhukov even exceeded his master Stalin. On the 4th of October 1941, Zhukov, as commander of the Leningrad Front, issued the following order. To make clear to all troops that all families of those who surrendered to the enemy would be shot, and they themselves would be shot upon return from prison. Ironically, it didn't occur to Zhukov when he issued this order that under it, Stalin himself was in theory liable to execution since his son, Yakov Zhukashvili, had recently surrendered to the Germans. I don't think Stalin was unduly worried. He simply admired Zhukov for his pitiless determination. But even Zhukov had sent virtually unarmed militia to their certain death against German panzer divisions in 1941, had no idea of the most cynical sacrifice of war in November 1942, which was carried out in his name. 
While Operation Uranus, the great plan to encircle Paulus's Six Army at Stalingrad, was being prepared, another offensive, a huge diversion, took shape much further north on the Kalinin and Western Fronts against the German Ninth Army. This was called Operation Mars and was the subject of a book by David Glantz. Glantz, unable to access the key documents in the archives, became utterly convinced that Mars was a genuine operation like Uranus at Stalingrad. But in fact, the main, in fact the sole objective of Mars was to ensure that not a single German division could be moved from the central part of the front to the southern part. And although Zhukov was responsible for supervising this operation as a Stavka representative, uh, he devoted far more time to planning Uranus and planning Mars. But in the view of Russian military historians, the factor which demonstrated that Mars was uh, a diversion and not as glance arguably a co-equal operation was the allocation of artillery ammunition. The six armies sent into battle as a diversion had virtually no artillery support, while the Stalingrad operation received plenty. And this imbalance suggests a staggering disregard for human life on the part of Stalin. But according to General Pavel Sudoplatov of the NKVD, the Soviet Secret Police, the ruthlessness went far further. He, <coughs> he described how details of Operation Mars were deliberately passed in advance to the Germans, to the enemy. The NKVD and GRU military intelligence had prepared what was called Operation Monastery, an infiltration of the German Abwehr, the German intelligence organization. Alexander Demyanov, the grandson of the leader of the Kuban Cossacks, had been instructed by the NKVD to allow himself to be recruited by German military intelligence. Since his family was well known in white emigre circles, the Germans had already identified him during the Nazi Soviet Pact as a possible agent for them. In early November, preparations were well advanced for Operation Uranus around Stalingrad and the diversionary attack of Operation Mars. And Demyanov was now instructed by his NKVD controllers to give the Germans detail of Mars. The disinformation planted through Alexander, wrote General Tsuroplatov, the NKVD chief of administration for special tasks, was kept secret even from Marshal Zhukov and was handed to me personally by General Fedor Fedotovich Kuznetsov of GRU in a sealed envelope. Zhukov, not knowing that this disinformation game was being played at his expense, paid a heavy price in the loss of thousands of men under his command. This was something of an understatement. This diversion cost the Red Army 215,674 casualties, just about the same as the total Allied casualties for D-Day and the whole of the Battle of Normandy. It was one of the most heartless sacrifices in the whole history of war.